We're learning more now about the man who breached security surrounding the White House yesterday by jumping over the spiked fence. As NBC News White House correspondent Kristen Welker tells us, eyewitnesses could hardly believe their eyes as it was happening. This morning, the Secret Service is investigating a new security breach on the White House grounds. Joseph Caputo climbed over the White House fence Thursday while President Obama and his family celebrated Thanksgiving inside. As Chris Van Cleve reports, this happened on the North Lawn in the middle of a nationwide security alert. The Uchino Cho means universal harmony. We'll all connect together as one. And Anagashima says, please, let's uh, interview, let's celebrate. And it's such a great honor to have you here. And uh, to do this Harmony Power presentation with you is, uh, you know, I just can't believe you're sitting there, right? And you're the guy that. Uh, I saw in the news a long time ago. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah. I really appreciate being here. And I, and I feel like it's um, as I got to as I'm, I know you somewhat, and I'm getting to know you more in this interview. I feel like uh, when I first saw what they said to be the the White House jumper, so why is this young kid jumping the fence, right? Because it made me think about you know there's times when we all as kids we all break rules in some way, right? Mm. We've all jumped the fence in some way. What was he saying? And they just kind of made a mock of it and I said, you know, they, we didn't hear what this kid had to say. Mm. And uh, as I got to know you somewhat and you sent me this constitution revision, I was blown away. It was like I had to take my time to read this piece by piece and, and I'm like, this was 10 years ago. And how it's so, it relates so much to what is going on right now in the world and yet, Everything that you were crying for this attention as a youngster, nobody paid attention. It was a misdemeanor and it was all this, you know, you know, getting you in court and then you, you know, proving yourself to be, you know, of good character and uh, and then all the good that you did after that is why I said I got to have him on my show and give him this special Harmony Power Award and honor him. Like uh, you're more of a hero to me. Look. Nobody should jump anyone's fence, let alone the White House fence, right? Obama's having his dinner, you're jumping the fence, the guy's trying to eat his turkey dinner. Yeah. That's messed up. But, big but, you always, why? There's other people who have done this before, but mm. no one got as much attention as you. And the, I, the irony is how the media captured it. They all made money from you jumping the fence, but nobody asked you why you did it. Yeah. No one even asked you, can I read what... That book, that thing that you jumped with it in your mouth over the fence, no one said, can I read that? Can you Can you please send, can Fox please send it, can CNN? Yeah. None of them did. And I carried or, the USB of it every yeah. day, yeah. Uh, leading up to, during, and after, kind of waiting to see if, if that was ever no, going to happen. No, it was about them making money off of some young kid doing something like that. Yeah. So to me, it, you, you were a hero as far as I'm concerned, because when I read it, so much of it had to do with us being free, what real freedom stands for, and that the people have the power, that the people should have their voice. Mm. And even with you projecting that, your voice still wasn't heard. Yeah, and I think it's relevant to note that people still aren't listening. The youth are still speaking very loudly today. And, you know, to be fair, nothing I said was really that new. No. I learned from the greats, I synthesized it, I tried to listen to people around me. I did a lot of the work in a vacuum. I could have benefited from right. being with a group and a team and then you know maybe that would have gone a little differently and I wouldn't have jumped the fence in the first place. Right. Uh, but I did the best I could on my own with that and I drew from the knowledge that came before. People are still saying the same things. Not just the same rhetoric of, of oppression, the same blooms of a new idea. They keep popping up every year perennially. The kids are coming out and saying, this is what we need. 
and there's solutions to all of our problems. There really are. It's it's really incredible because you also if you see you know with bullying and mass shootings and mm -hmm. when you look at the 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 heart of why a person's a mass shooter, in some level they were not heard. They were not listening to the young generation. They cried for help. No one heard them, and then they wanted to know why they're out of control. Mm -hmm. Well, and if we fabricate a mental health crisis and an epidemic of depression and a a system of psychological scarcity and lack of community, we cannot be surprised when statistically more often than not, you start to get a lot of these outliers, not as outliers, as a commonality. These, we have a mass shooting in this country almost every day, and the psychological makeup of these people is almost identical. Right. At that point, you know, as a, as a sociologist, as a sociologist, as a psychologist, you have to look at it and say, if people are coming out very consistently that dangerous, how much are we at fault as a, as a society, as an insane society? Eric Fromm wrote a book called Escape from Freedom and a book called The Sane Society. And the first he talked about, because he was a German uh, positive psychologist, mm -hmm. he came to America and he wanted to talk about why we choose fascism. And he argued that freedom is scary, anxiety inducing, and horrifying. But security feels safe. So even the bravest and boldest of us will probably choose security more often than we think. And then he took that book a step further and he talked about the sane society and he says, what does it mean to diagnose an entire uh, macrocosm, a social consciousness, uh, with sanity or an insanity? And it's very tongue in cheek. He's not trying to make it a true diagnosis, but he's essentially arguing sometimes a society is actually insane. If it doesn't provide for the health of its people, for the welfare of its people, if it pits people against each other, then all of a sudden some of the rebels might actually be the well-adjusted, even though that society condemns them as the maladjust. And I'm not saying those are the mass shooters, yes. but that's where you get the Johnny Cashes. That's where you get the activists. That's where you get the modern students rising up. I feel this is what I feel. The more you know, as I got to know you and what it had occurred, is that. You're truly a symbol. It's your, it, what you did then was symbolic of the struggle we're having right now, but in a beautiful way. It's it's not in the, in, in the negative they tried to project. It was more like in the sense of this young generation that wants to be heard. It's the generation today that wants to understand this newfound freedom. Hmm. Now whether you're you know, for Trump or for Biden, regardless of what side of the fence you're on, or for Kennedy. Pun intended. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, so if you look at the root, we're all seeking freedom. Mm. And we're believing in someone or something to attain more of what that is. Mm. So you didn't just jump the fence. You had in your pocket a 50-page document. 50 mm -hmm. pages, right? Yeah, uh, 47. Yeah, somewhere in the 50 department. It was a lot of text to read. And it was deep. And I'd say most of it, I'd be like, would actually, if they used aspects of it today, the government would be far better than what it is. And the fact that they just didn't even read it, mm -hmm. or, or they, and they gave it back to you, I'm like, yeah. you can't make this stuff up. How disinterested they were in the person who jumped the fence. It wasn't like you jumped the fence and ran all over there and was, you know, destroying things. You just jumped, stood there with a flag wrapped around you with your hands up. Yeah. I'm like, that's awesome, right? Well, I, mean, I yeah. went to DC. Uh, I, at the time, I was studying at University of Bridgeport, which is an incredible school. Mm -hmm. If you said a single thing out loud, yeah. in a loving way, they made you prove your point. There was no safety. You got to, if you were religious, you talked with atheists and everyone of every other religion. You all grew in your knowledge. I was very privileged to have an amazing school that I went to because no one let you just say something. Right. They all engaged you in this beautiful dialogue, and that dialogue gave me hope because it was not something I saw anywhere else in the country. No. It's not something you see on TV right. with pundits just putting opinions together. So I went to D.C. with a degree in martial arts, a degree in criminology. So going through the stages of custody, I knew what the orders were. Because you went to school for it. So they were starting to get annoyed with me. Yes. <laughs> because two words would come out of their mouth, and I kind of know what the next step of the procedure was. And, yeah. You know, you to, to, yeah, I wasn't trying to be a problem look, for them. They're working too that day. Look, just to reiterate again, I, I never, I don't want anyone to see this to think that 
whatever they're doing that is ever right on any level, across, mm -hmm. you know, trespassing, going over the White House fence, none of it is correct. But yeah. the intention of what it was, and that it was peacefully done, mm -hmm. harmoniously done, well orchestrated, you don't see that. You, you know, when, when January 6th occurred, it wasn't a peaceful protest. No. They invaded the Capitol. At least a percentage of them did and had a violent intent. Yeah. Right? While, you know, our leader was eating Cheetos in the White House, which is another story. <laughs> uh, you know, I just don't want to get into that. But the, the reality is that there were a lot of people there that still were crying for freedom. Mm. A lot. And as I'm sure there are people that were prosecuted that maybe shouldn't have been, but we don't know. We'd have to go through that. But I have an empathy for this cry out for a country that is free, mm. that, that people want to be heard. And they're afraid to say what they say without being feeling attacked. I could sit with somebody who loves Trump and sit with somebody who loves Biden and have great conversations. Mm. And that, in fact, these are friends of mine that I love dearly. And I feel that uh, there's aspects of Trump and aspects of Biden that's we had to learn from. Mm. Good, bad, or indifferent. There's aspects of who they were in power that we learned from. Good, bad, indifferent, regardless. Yeah. You know, and then we have now Kennedy, you know, on the rise, and for obvious reasons, because of, you know, his track record of standing up to the establishment and wanting to make the kind of change that really requires change. Um, but back to you, I have to say that uh, I'm deeply touched by what you had done and the, and the incredible intention of it. Thank you. You were actually standing for your country. You were, look, you're getting the Harmony Power Award today because it's about standing up to bullying and standing for human equality. So mm -hmm. standing up to bullying, you're standing up to the, the aspects of leadership in our country that need to change. Yeah. Not all the leaders are bad. There's a few bad ones, and it's making it hard for the whole group. Yeah. Right? And you stood up for human equality because you felt that as citizens, we were not being treated fairly. I saw every day, and throughout the annals of history, since the dawn of our country, mm -hmm. groups either for corporate interests or because of governmental neglect or purposeful attack, becoming marginalized, oppressed, destroyed, mm -hmm. every single day. And those who would fight with them being treated as violent revolutionaries when they weren't, and assassinated, or being mired in a psychological campaign. It, you know, you know, know, now know my story is far more interesting than he's a delusional superhero lover, which mm -hmm. was such an easy story for them to ride. So when I did what I did, I did it because I knew 2016 was going to be a nightmare election. And I didn't know what was going to happen. I'm not clairvoyant. But you see the contours, you get the pattern recognition, and you look at it and you go, oh, I'm just doing it great job locking down some elements that when he's gone Pandora's box oh, is just gonna f he had a character and a a skill set that whether you loved him or hated him or whatever you cannot argue that that skill set and that character existed absent that power hates a vacuum and I knew that the questions and the answers that our country was going to go through through so, the next election so was going to be monumental I suppose you liked Obama yeah, I mean, I had some issues with a lot of policies, but I wouldn't not shake his hand. Right. You know, right. I think he was a far less morally condemnable person than the two we've had since. I mean, you interfered his dent with his dentist, so that's why I wanted to ask you if you liked the guy. I'm definitely sorry. So, so a fun fact about me interviewing his dinner is I know nothing about right. the guy. You didn't know that, right? Yeah. yeah, so I know nothing about the guy, so I used just reason. I was like, he's a traveling president, he's from Chicago. He's not going to be there at Thanksgiving. This is a safe day. I won't interrupt his time. He had his whole family there. I felt so bad when I learned. I thought the Secret Service was messing with me, like, psychologically. They were like, yeah, you know he's inside, right? I was like, yeah. not that I acted that way, but I was like, oh, okay. But in my mind, I was like, he's not here. Yeah. They would have shot me if he was here. I should have given them more credit. Yeah. You know, because he was there, and they didn't shoot me. And thank God. But, so yeah, so I, I saw that there was this huge machine and 
you know, I didn't know anything. I was 22. I didn't know about all the groups out there trying to make a difference. And Instagram, I just downloaded it. So nowadays it's so much easier to network. But I was of the gen that was more X than Z millennials. So right. a lot of that, I didn't get an iPhone until I was 21 years old. We didn't have some of those ways to easily connect with each other. Yeah. So even if I had held out, gone to law school, and then met some people, it could have been a, a different type of protest. But at the time, you know, I did what I thought I could do with the resources I have. I have my calves. I have this psychological Kevlar of an outfit that looks lame, I know, but hey, I, I never got shot. So right. maybe it did its job. But what I really did is I took those two or three years I looked at everybody's stories, I looked at all these groups and, and all this history and I said, if Congress won't do its job and the government won't do its job, there are all these agencies out there, all these organizations of people, lawyers, right, concerned citizens, of all types of political agenda, but their whole goal is constitutional reform. So my theory was, you can't enforce a good law and know it'll be enforced forever. New political interests come in. You can't destroy a bad law and know it'll be going forever because new legislators will come in. But if you use the heartbeat of the law, if you re give a constitutional restatement, a constitutional convention, a constitutional, legal, political, peaceful revolution of mind, all of a sudden, now we have the option, if we so choose, to participate. So my goal was to establish a system where, you know, nowadays you go on your phone, you hover for a half a second, you're going to get more ads for that. So they know your voice. When it's about you giving them money, they have your voice. So why can't we do that? That same thing, that same thing that is real, tangible, proven, we can't use that to source people's voices? We can't have a true electronic democracy? 100%. Yeah. And, it was, and it was things like that that, that were mind-blowing mind-blowing realities that the solutions were there. It's just that the powers to be create complexity mm. for their own self-interest. Yes. And usually that self-interest has always led to the pocket, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, I'm a, look, I'm a veteran, right? So I served during the first Gulf War and I understood your protest, illegal protest, but it was still with a beautiful intention at heart. Thank you. My protest was, I went to my commander and said, I want out. I said, these soldiers are coming back, missing arms and legs, and these are our young soldiers. I said, and Saddam Hussein is dumping oil into the sea. That's his protest. Why? Because it's very obvious it's an oil deal gone bad. And both administrations at that time, Biden and the Bush administration, supported that war. They felt there was a need to be in that war. And we all know if we took the oil out of the region, there'd be no war. Mm -hmm. But our young soldiers, our young men and women, mm -hmm. sacrificed their lives. And there were stories when people came, soldiers came back, I would hear them saying things like, we had to shoot and they had no guns. And there were mm -hmm. thousands that they had to take. And it was given as an award. And that's war. War is a horrible atrocity. Mm -hmm. And I feel that you know these kinds of things happen in war. You know, people are shot down as you know instead of holding prisoners of war, they take the lives and they're given those commands to win. But there was no winner in that. We yeah. created a, a horrible situation that perpetuates the Middle East that was requires uh, a modern day peaceful intervention. Yeah. And what you're describing is a war crime that the Nuremberg trials have outlined. It is lawful. And, and the duty of a soldier, if they determine that this is a civilian or an unarmed person, to defy that order. And and I'm sorry that you have had to see that, have to meet so many oh, friends yeah. who've gone through that. Yeah. Because I mean, uh, you see it now. Every genocide going on is happening because of a resource and good people who just want to help others right. are being caught up in the sociopolitical control mechanism of being told you have to compel, you are compelled to obey this order. Yes. And the, and the thing too is that, you know, I love my country, I love America. And all the things that America struggles with, race, color, creed, sexual orientation, when you're out there, your fellow soldiers, you're just American. 
Yeah. Nothing about any of them. Yeah. So that's another thing I wanted to mention is that that's important. So when I during the time that I served, I was, you know, a top soldier, and they did the best that I could, and they gave me an honorable discharge. And it was overall a great experience. Even the tragedy of that was a great experience. It made me realize that uh, there's much that goes on that people don't know. And war is leadership failure. It has nothing to do with what's right or wrong. Someone usually wants more than they should be getting. Mm -hmm. And the people go out who are just trying to take care of their families to go pay the price for those in power who want to obtain more than what they should have. Yep. It's been going on that since the beginning of human kind. Yeah. And uh, so in, in modern day, the casualties are so vast. So that's why I had uh, empathy and, and wanting to understand you for that. Thank you. Uh, is understanding that, that idea, like why, why would someone jump the fence? It's good. Because it relates to, it's relatable to me. Yeah. I get it. I get it. You feel disempowered, therefore you need to feel, need to feel empowered by making a move so that your voice is heard and your voice represents American voices that are not being heard. Yeah, I had a deep desire to serve and I didn't have a direction, so I created one, right, wrong, or indifferent. Um, and I've obviously been very lucky to have mentors since, and I had mentors then, but I, I did things in a vacuum and didn't invite my mentors into that mm -hmm. to really learn from it. But I think there's something you'll find interesting is uh, maybe two or three months after the fence, I'm home, I have a bracelet on, uh, we meet an old family friend named Victor Carroll, who much like you was a Marine, and he was a Marine in Vietnam, but he, like you, was someone who had some moral protests against the war, mm -hmm. but he was 1,000% there because he loved his brothers, and he loved his country, and trying to reconcile that with the reality around him. He and I had some very long, beautiful talks, and I ended up writing a screenplay about his life, um, and I'm gonna go see him in, in Florida this summer. And one thing that I found when I was talking with him, he brought me over to the DAV and I started driving trucks for the disabled American veterans out of, out of West Haven. And there were a couple of different organizations we drove with and did things for, but one was called Take a Vet Fishing out of Brantford. And all these guys, so, you know, you had not a lot of World War II guys, you know, they're, they're legends and celebrities when we were able to get them out there, but it was more, a lot of Vietnam guys, a lot of Gulf War guys, a um, lot of modern day Iraq War veterans coming back, kind of not sure if they want to go fish with the old guys because they're younger, you know. Mm -hmm. But every single soldier, not only were they so unique in what they were going through, they all outlined the same emotional and socio-political issues that hurt them. And they were all abandoned in their own time. That's it. And so they had to be there together. They had to be. And so now a system abandons them, lets them collect. It doesn't help them, but maybe when it's voting time, yeah. speaks a couple words to them, tries to get them over. In this modern world with psychometrics, they get you in a pocket, a tribe, and then they try and say, these are our chess pieces. Well, you know, with this group is going to be scared to be around this group, and this group is going to be scared to be around this group. So let's weaponize the misunderstanding. It's going to sound so hokey, but having a conversation dispels so much of that power. Not that, it, I'm sorry, I ran away from the ball a little bit. Well, you know, it, it is a thing, right? So it's very easy to, uh, when it comes to, you know, whether it's political leadership, corporate leadership, mm -hmm. there's a lot of good people. I ran for Congress in the 10th District of New Jersey as a libertarian. So I learned, and I did it because I felt like I wanted to serve my country, and I was very concerned about the, the Parties fighting, so let me just go down the libertarian road. Mm. It was a wonderful experience for me. <clears throat> that being said, I learned that there's leaders that are good, there's ones that are bad, and there's, and there's ones that are in between. So it, when you have leadership that is bad or doesn't have the, the level of integrity, it's incredibly damaging mm -hmm. because that top down is very painful for pain. Yes. It affects their pockets at the end of the day. Yeah. So, but I'm very, uh, I would say that I'm. You know, I'm more optimistic by what's coming in the future for us because what's happening with this political turmoil 
is that everything's just coming up to the surface. So there's a lot of truths that we're seeing that has always been mm -hmm. that needs to change. And now as American citizens and citizens of the world, we have an opportunity more now than ever in history to make a change for more freedom in a deeper sense than we've ever, mm -hmm. ever even known. Yeah. That's the beauty of it. So that's why I think, you know, with the, this incredible connection and, and meeting you and, you know, and honor you with this Harmony Power Award, you put that link with your, your constitution, right? Thank you. You're going to get that web link so that people can, can download it and read it and see yeah. what things they can take from it. But I also want to honor you because you, I have this here before I give this to you, I'd like you to share just in a minute or two, just what you did for veterans, because that's, you're getting this Army Power Award, not just because you made a bold stance for, uh, for freedom and for equality and, you know, standing up to the negative aspects of leadership that we were dealing with at that time, but you went and took, even though they ostracized you, they tried to paint the picture of you that was untrue, and then everything came, all that truth came out, that you were fine, you were mentally sound, you're a good person, trying to do the right thing and you move forward and you, you're living a great life. You actually went and did a lot of good for the veterans. And I just feel like I, you know, that generosity, you know, you could take the trauma of what they tried to create and paint the picture of you and done her and her people. But no, you're like, I'm gonna go help the world. I'm gonna, I, I was trying to speak to the world. They won't let me and they're trying to, you know, suppress me. I'm gonna go do some great things now. Thank you. What was, can you just share some of those great things you did for veterans? Well, you know, at first I'll admit, I hid from the world, Yeah, you know, and uh, maybe that wasn't the right thing. Maybe I should have come out and spoken and done a little more. But I was so scared of my voice now being caustic or damaging, mm -hmm. being bad goods. Um, but the right people in the right place at the right time got me to talk to more right people, right place, right time. So, you know, within six months of the protest, I was driving a government vehicle on my ankle bracelet, wow. picking up veterans from uh, the, the military hospital in West Haven, from the VA. We would go to, there were three organizations, there was the Disabled American Veterans, there was the Marine Corps League, a lot of the guys drove, uh, forgive me, four. Uh, there was Operation Gift Cards, which would always go down to Walter Reed Military Hospital, which because of my status, as hard as the guys lobbied, I was never allowed to go. Um, but I would always help them load and offload the trucks. They would go bring gifts and, and Girl Scout cookies and just anything that could give an emotional thank you gesture to, to guys literally just hitting stateside with, with who knows what kind of psychological or physical wounds. So I was happy to at least help load the trucks and be a part of that. And then there was the take of that fishing program where we would get as many of them as we could together, get a day out of their rehab, out of their, you know, some of them have lost legs or they came back with some kind of addiction or some kind of psychological torment. They're just trying to figure out what kind of life they want to live. And these fishing days, I'll tell you, they did as much for me as for them because you just start listening to guys. Yeah, it's incredible. And they have amazing stories. And you, you, you could take the most, you know, uh, you know, I was in Iraq. Yeah, I was, I was in Fallujah. This guy's Vietnam. No, he's a god. I don't want to talk. You know, these guys looked up to you. And now you're letting them in. They're coming out of their shell and like, oh yeah, I ride bikes too. You ride bikes? Okay, I'll come down to the VFW. I'll come down. Yeah. And they just start coming out of their shell making those connections and I think I was a good person now how they hire for that. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. Yeah, serve them food, drive them around, this, talk with them, help them out. So you know, so people can take trauma and do great things for the world. Yeah, there's post-traumatic stress, yes. There's post-traumatic growth. And some scar tissue is what it is, yes. But you can still find that thing that you want to do. And when you're ready, and heal and you can do it um, and it, it, it's your clock and someone else can't make it happen for you society can't make it happen for you it, it comes from you but it's waiting for you like a destiny you can grow and recover especially when you feel like you can't yeah. uh, from anything yeah. so that's that's what I was able to, to do with with the guys and every now and again I try and drive for them still but I've been in and out of New York it's been a challenge since COVID to really do anything substantial for them but they're great guys, they're still working very hard at what they do. And uh, every now and again, we get to share a phone call or an email. Well, let's first do, do a quick toast to you. Gumpai. Gumpai. Mm. 
All right, here we go. Let's see that. I'll read that. Certificate of Award, Harmony Power. Joseph Perez Caputo has been awarded the certificate for dedication, commitment, and outstanding efforts in promoting harmony in the world. So this is something I proudly give to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here and sharing this incredible story. It's, uh, yeah, I believe you're the hero of the times with, with everything you've represented and what you've done. And I hope as many Americans that are out there can see this video, particularly that picture. It's just, yeah. you know, you can't make that stuff up. It was a good picture. That was Vanessa Pena. Yeah. I never got the honor of meeting her, but yeah. she's a brilliant landscape photographer with one political picture. Yeah. Uh, so anyone listening or watching should go yeah. seek her work. Um, and just to let you know, I appreciate you saying things about heroics, but I think there's going to be a lot more and a lot better than me. Yes, and I would We're say that if, if anybody has any ambitions to ever jump a fence, don't ever do it. No. I would say that you can protest before you, you could be before the fence. So you can, you know, <laughs> well, they're but, doing that as we speak, the red line. Yeah. It's going around the White House right now. Yeah, so that, that to me is having those kinds of protests I support. But I don't support your action, I support what your action meant for the world. I think just so that you know that, I want the world to know that that's how it feels. I'm a veteran, we have to be safe. You. You're a young kid, it was a, a choice, and you took that, that choice you made, and the mistake you made, you, know, you did all this good to help veterans. I mean, it's incredible, and in and, and that Constitution, people have to read it. Thank you. They have to read it. So thank you so much for coming here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Secret Service is digging deeper tonight into why Joseph Caputo, a 23-year-old Connecticut man, jumped over the nearly eight-foot-high spiked White House fence on Thanksgiving Day while the first family celebrated inside. Seconds after his jump, the Secret Service had him in custody. Wearing gloves wrapped in an American flag and carrying a binder between his teeth, Joseph Caputo hopped the fortified fence, landing on the north lawn of the presidential residence. The woman who took these photos tweeted, I heard him take a deep breath and whisper, all right, let's do this, and went for it. Caputo raised his arms afterwards. It's unclear if it was in celebration or in surrender. The Secret Service moved in almost immediately with guns drawn. Caputo dropped to his knees, his hands still in the air, and laid down on the ground before being taken into custody.